All right, welcome in, Georgia Tech fans, as it's another week and another big game for the Jackets inside Mercedes-Benz Stadium. And I'm joined by Brian Driscoll of Irish Breakdown. And Brian, uh, we were kind of chatting before we went on air here, and uh, this is a matchup that's intriguing. I know yeah. that if you're into the gambling side of sports that this line's creeping up, but altogether, hopefully for a lot of people, uh, this Georgia Tech-Notre Dame game is going to be a little more entertaining yeah. than the last time these two teams faced off. Yeah, yeah, that'd be that what fifty-five to nothing game a few years ago. I think that was what that was that the last year of the Jeff Collins era, the second to last year of the Jeff the Collins era. The last full year. He was yeah. fired about four or five games into the yeah. next season. Yeah, that was uh that was you know, that's not what I'm used to, right? I mean, I, I grew up in the nineties is was my formative years. You know, I played high school football in the nineties, began my college playing career in the nineties, and I grew up big Joe Hamilton fan, you know, remember mm-hmm. him back in the day. And I even remember uh, Sean Jones, right? That was a, the quarterback yeah. in 1990. You know, so I, re- I remember that I was a six foot quarterback. So I loved any six foot quarterback I could find, man. But, uh, it, you know, and then you even remember like the 06 season when Reggie Ball and, and Calvin Johnson gave Notre Dame everything they could handle in that 14 to 10 Notre Dame win. Then obviously Georgia Tech smacked Notre Dame pretty good that next year to kick off the 2020, <laughs> 2007 season. But yeah, it, it was disappointing to see that, to see them fall the way that they did. But I'm, I'm very happy that Brent Keys got them rocking and rolling because. You know, I think that's a program that the ACC needs to be good to really give that league some credibility because Georgia Tech does play Georgia every year because they are willing to schedule tough out of conference. I think that's a team that the ACC really, really needs. And they're in that big Georgia Atlanta market. They need the Yellow Jackets to be good. So I'm I'm very happy to see what Brent Key is doing with the program. Well, you just made a lot of Georgia Tech fans happy, and maybe they'll tune Speaking in. Speaking truth. Speaking there. truth. Yeah, I like it. I like <laughs> it. Truth. Well, let's, let's kind of talk about it. And you teased mm-hmm. it right here. What is the the mood, the temperature of Notre Dame fan, this fan base, and you obviously have a good pulse on that, heading into this matchup? Obviously, it's a team that everyone wants to point out the Northern Illinois loss, but when you really look into what they've done since, they've grown, as you know, Brian, teams are allowed to evolve over the course right. of the season. You're allowed right. to do that. Right. Uh, what, what's the mood? What's the temperature of the fan base entering this matchup? Well, a lot of Notre Dame fans are still feeling the same way that a lot of outsiders are. You know, I, I had this beef with AP voters, and, you know, the, you talk about all this hype that Clemson's getting, right? Because, well, they have a great loss to Georgia. I'm like, yeah, but who have they beat since then? Their yeah. best win is over a three and four football team in, in NC State, whereas Notre Dame has beaten a top 15 team in Texas AM on the road. They beat a top 15 team in Louisville, which Georgia Tech mm-hmm. knows what kind of team that is, in a game where Notre Dame had a double digit lead almost the entire game, or at least half the game, over half the game. You know, but it's just Northern Illinois, Northern Illinois. And that's the focus of a lot of Notre Dame fans, too. And I, I think the last two games have sort of gotten fans to be a little bit more cautiously optimistic about this team. But I think part of the reason that people haven't fully bought in is because of this game right here, to be completely mm-hmm. honest with you. This was a game that a lot of us talked about in the offseason as a bit of a trap game for Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. You know, before Navy, after, you know, Louisville and Stanford, you know, you're going to have this big, huge game against Florida State coming up in a few weeks. You're going to have the big game against USC because, of course, at the time, we didn't realize Florida State was going to be just absolutely terrible. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so this was that game. You know, Is this a game you overlook? Do you look past them with that dynamic quarterback? And I had – Uh, I had Haynes King. I do an all opponent team before the season. And I had Haynes King as my second team quarterback. Mm -hmm. And I had Jamal uh, Haynes as my first team running back. And I was like, y'all, and I should have put Eric Singleton as a receiver, but I ended up making a prediction that Moose Muhammad would have a breakout season at A&M. That hasn't gone overly well, you know, but uh, this is a very talented team an athletic team and a team that can score. And that's Mm -hmm. always a recipe for an upset is, is I never worry about, well, except for the Northern Illinois game. Usually upsets don't happen when you project them because a team wins 16 to 14. That's not normally how upset upsets usually happen because you play some team that can just score on you like Vanderbilt against Alabama, right? Where they just outscore you. And, and so this, when you looked at this Georgia tech team, you're like, I don't know if their defense is going to be any good, but that offense is dangerous. Well, then you see early in the season, like, Hey, their defense is much improved. And I think, so there's a little bit of angst. And of course, with all the injuries that Notre Dame is battling right now, there's sort of that cautious optimism where if they can get through this game, then I think people will fully buy in and say, okay, you know what? This team does have a chance to go on a run, and uh, but this game is going to be a big part of that for, for Notre Dame fans to really buy into this team again. You talked about that Georgia Tech defense when you kind of, I say, pack in all the different statistical numbers. It's a top 30, top 35 unit, especially in the run defense category. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they have been very good in the run. Talk to me a little bit about this Notre Dame offense. Once again, we talk about growing. I think it's safe to say, and Brian, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that Riley Leonard has grown up. A veteran has kind of grown up into this role here at Notre Dame. What has his development been like over the course of the season and just this offense overall? I mean, 
look, you see behind me, people know I talk about Georgia Tech, also cover LSU. So Mike Denbrock being a big piece to the puzzle there uh, in South Bend. What has the development of the offense been like over the past couple of weeks? Well, just getting comfortable in the offense is a big thing for Riley Leonard. I mean, when you go back and study the first couple of games, you know, the AM game, he played pretty well. You know, he had some misses, but he made some big time plays and obviously made two big time throws mm-hmm. on that that last drive, the the drive that broke the tie. And then obviously Notre Dame kind of put it away after a stop and then a field goal. Uh, but, you know, the Northern Illinois game, the the Purdue game, even to a degree, the Miami game, there were just some some throws you're like, you know, he's just missing simple throws. And then against Northern Illinois, he wasn't making just the basic reads and he just didn't look comfortable in the offense. And it didn't look like they necessarily knew how to use him, which was a byproduct of him missing the entire spring because of an injury that he suffered from Notre Dame last year when he was a Duke, right? So it's kind of your fault, you know what I mean? You broke him. Uh, and, and what you've seen the last couple games, it started against Louisville early and it obviously continued into this game against Stanford, is he's starting to look more comfortable. So you're seeing him, yeah. you know, first drive of the game, you know, he hits a couple little just eight-yard comeback routes. But when you go look at the film, you'll see he's reading left. It's not there. So then he knows to come right back to the – he. I know that's not there. I'm coming back to this backside comeback mm-hmm. route. And he throws it quick. Bo Collins catches it, eight-yard gain. You know, you get in position to move the chains. It's not a big play. But it's one of those things where you're saying, okay, he's getting more command of the offense, They're, which is allowing them to be more efficient offensively. So yeah. they got into a lot more third and ones and third and twos. Part of the reason the third down offense sucks is because they found themselves in so many third and eights, third and tens, third and twelves because of just not being an efficient offense. I mean, they are a big, they've been a big time boomer bust offense so far with Jadarian Price and Jeremiah Love and Riley Leonard that the efficiency piece hasn't been there. Well, as he's gotten more comfortable in the offense, the efficiency piece is coming. And so they're getting more four to six to eight yard gains on first down. And so they're getting in more second and twos and they're getting in more third and ones, which is allowing the offense to move the chains without relying on the big play. And that's allowed them to score more effectively and and be more efficient. So it's just him getting comfortable in the offense and then Mike Denbrock having a better idea of what's he good at and what's he maybe not so good at because he's not Jaden Daniels. They're very different players. (laughs) You know, as far as and not even like he's not as good as Jay. It just their just style of play yeah. is very different. How you're going to build an offense or with around Riley Leonard is going to be very different than how you're going to build your offense around Jaden Daniels. You know, Jaden Daniels had a ton of yards scrambling mm-hmm. and and on some RPO reads out of empty. Well, Riley Leonard is running quarterback counter and quarterback power and quarterback zone. Very different type of running player there. So uh, as he's getting more comfortable with. Riley, that's also impacting it. And then, of course, they've had massive injuries at the offensive line. Yeah. That group is starting to finally settle in together. That was their third game together. Going into this game will be their fourth. So you hope that they're kind of coming uh, together a little bit. And, and those things are all factoring into it. And, uh, and the final piece, Bryce, is when Notre Dame started the season, their starting lineup had nine players that had freshman or sophomore eligibility. The only two seniors were Bo Collins and Riley Leonard, who were not with the team in the spring. Or at least Riley was, but he didn't practice because of the injury. Bo was not able to practice in the spring. So it was a group that hadn't played a lot of football and hadn't played together. And you're starting to see them start to come together a little bit. And that's, uh, you know, a reason why you're seeing improved play. Are they there yet? No, they're not there yet. Stanford's not very good. But they're getting there. Yeah, and to your point, teams are allowed to evolve. They're allowed to struggle. And if you're Notre Dame, I mean, I think, you know, I said this a lot about a lot of teams. If you're a Notre Dame fan, I think there's a little bit of uh, excitement about the fact that your team didn't peak early in the season. You sure. don't want to be the best team in college football. I say this, you know, there's there's some outliers in September. You sure. want to start playing your best ball when the weather gets a little bit colder. Uh, you mentioned a lot of names there, but for Georgia Tech fans and for this defense in particular, I think the nervousness and the 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 queasiness of, of facing Riley Leonard in this offense is, hey, Georgia Tech's defense has been picked apart, especially in the middle of the field, against high-level quarterback play. Kyle McCord, you know, you can say what you want about Syracuse the rest of the season. He just went off against Georgia Tech in that football game. Um, and then even, you know, Tyler Shuck to, to an extent, and, and North Carolina State was able to do some things in the middle of the field. What exactly would be your game plan against this Georgia Tech defense? What are some plays that you think need to be dialed up, and where are some of the mismatches you feel like between Notre Dame's offense and Georgia Tech's defense? Well, see, this is what makes this matchup interesting because where Notre Dame is good, Georgia Tech is good. That's running the football. Where Notre Dame is not as good is where Georgia Tech's not very good, which is defending the pass, which is going to make this very fascinating. And that's how it was with Stanford. Yeah. And what we saw last week from Notre Dame is uh, we saw them really ramp up the RPO breakdown 
or the RPOs a lot. I just did a breakdown on that uh, on our site, Irish Breakdown, our premium board, where I kind of went through all the RPO plays. And that was really the first time we've seen them run RPOs with those glance routes, which is over the middle of the field behind those linebackers and in front of the safeties. We had most of it's been like hitches and unders and quick outs and things of the outside. And we saw Notre Dame attack over the top with a post route for a big play in that game from the slot. And and that hasn't been an area where Notre Dame has had a lot of success because when you have a quarterback who's not comfortable reading a defense, the last place you want him to throw is the middle of the field. Yeah. And so the last couple of games, we're starting to see more of that. You know, they threw a seam route for a touchdown against Louisville for a big, a 34 yard touchdown against Louisville. So they've started to get to that point. You know, Riley's coming back to some backside digs when the front side read isn't open, things along those lines. And so, you know, that's an area where Notre Dame has, has got to get rolling. And Notre Dame has yet to get their tight ends really going in the offense this year. And I think this would be a great game to finally see the off the tight ends kind of step up and and, and do their thing. So, uh, you know, it, it, it is a fascinating matchup because it's, it's good on good in one aspect and then it's not very good against not very good. So which part of your, your team that's not as good can step up and make plays? You know, which Notre Dame receiver can step up and make plays? Is it Bo Collins? Is it Chris Mitchell? Is it Jaden Greathouse? Is it one of the tight ends? But at the end of the day, this game is going to come down to, Bryce, can Georgia Tech stop Jeremiah Love, the three-headed monster of Jeremiah Love, Jadarian Price, and, and Riley Leonard? That's re- mm-hmm. you know, on the ground. That's really what it comes down to. And can Notre Dame come up with a game plan to allow their running game to get going? Because they faced a really good run defense last year or last week against Stanford. They stink yeah. at a lot of things, but they're pretty good run defense. <laughs> and, you know, I think Clemson went for a buck 50 and had five yards of carry. As you know, Clemson runs the ball really well on people this year. Yeah. And and Notre Dame torched that that defense. I mean, it just it didn't matter. First team, second team, third team. It didn't matter who. And they didn't even use Riley Leonard in the run game. They only had three designed runs the whole game. Everything else was scrambles. You know, and they were able to find some success. And and that's the thing. And, and A&M learned this, right? Like, as you can ball them up, ball them up, ball them up, 46-yard touchdown. You know what I mean? Ball yep. them up, ball them up, ball them up, 50-yard touchdown. I mean, that's that's what makes this run game dangerous. Like, there was a, a, a sequence against A&M where Notre Dame was, you know, in deep in their own territory, and Jadarian Price rips off a 37-yard gain, and he gets called – Notre Dame gets called for holding. They pull it back. It's first and 20. And they hand the ball off to Jeremiah Levin. He goes for 29. You know what I mean? It's like it's a real dynamic run game. And when you've got a quarterback that is such a legitimate run threat that Riley Leonard is, it makes it harder to key on those backs every play. Because you make one mistake and it's Riley's going or the backs are going. You know, Louisville's game plan was we are going to stop the, you know, the, the or Miami's game plan was we are going to shut down the running backs. And they did. But Riley Leonard rushed for 143 yards on 13 carries. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. you know, so which one do you, you know, which one do you want to stop? Right. Yeah. And and Purdue tried to defend both. And so Jeremiah Love went for 100 yards. Riley Leonard went for 100 yards. And Jadarian Price almost went for 100 yards because he ran a 70 yard draw play on, you know, with th- 50 seconds left in the half when they're even trying to run the play out, run the clock out basically and just run it up the middle. And he makes a dude miss and then outruns the defense for a 70 yard touchdown. That's been the danger. If you can stop that, you got a pretty good chance to keep the name's points down. If you yeah. can't, then they're going to score a lot of points. It's a big if. Uh, you right. know, this is the Tech defense, and we talked a little bit about Tyler Santucci. You've obviously had some encounters with him. Uh, it's an improved defensive front, improved beyond what I thought and a lot of portraits in the fan base thought, making a jump from where statistically you were in the hundreds in terms of a lot of, you know, defensive categories last year. Now you're a top 30 run defense. Pass defense needs some work, but uh, it's strength on strength. And uh, I know Brent Key – uh, he'll he'll definitely take that message to his team in the locker room of hey what we're good at they're good at and let let the best man win. Let's flip it over to the defensive side of the football here real quick because for Notre Dame obviously at face value like for Georgia Tech fans that don't know a lot about Notre Dame and the ins and outs as much as you guys do they say okay yeah Marcus Freeman defensive guy there's an expectation that there's going to be a good defense in South Bend. Talk a little bit about the growth of this unit maybe some of the names that tech tech fans can circle. Hey, this is a guy we have to watch out for. And then, you know, we were talking about this a little bit and, you know, we'll, we'll let fan fans know as much as we can here, but we will see to what extent Haynes King can be utilized sure. in this game. That's a massive factor in this game. Is he a hundred percent? What is a 75, 60% version of Haynes King look like? I know it's a big question mark, but regardless, how does Notre Dame game plan for this offense that still has weapons outside of Haynes King? It could sure. look different if he doesn't play for sure, but how do they game plan for this? Well, I think it's really for Notre Dame. It's about do what you do. I mean, when you're as good as Notre Dame is on defense, it's do what you do, right? Mm-hmm. Don't, don't make mistakes. Don't give them big plays. You know, you're talking about a defense that the from from Mo efficiency index ranks as the number one defense in the country right now. Yeah, and I believe ESPN's um, 
know, the metrics they use for their, you know, playoff resumes. I think they had Notre Dame like th- as the third best defense in college football. Wow. And it, it's kind of funny, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there picking apart the Stanford game and I'm like, you know, they, they didn't do this as well as I would like. They missed this tackle. And then you look at it, you're like, dude, they had 200 yards of offense and scored seven points. <laughs> and 85 of those yards came on the first two drives. You know what I mean? It's like you, you start to get to the point where they're, they're so dominant that you almost kind of, you know, you start having unrealistic expectations yeah. for what they're going to do, you know, and you, and you look like the Louisville game and you, you gave up 24 points. Yeah. Louisville had a nine yard touchdown drive and a 24 yard touchdown drive, right? Like it's George Texas. Well, they gave up 31 points to Louisville. No, their defense didn't give up 31 points to Louisville. Their special teams gave up a touchdown and their offense gave up a touchdown. Right. And that's kind of how it was in that game a little bit. And, and so it's really just do what you do. And, and Notre Dame is a very aggressive, fast, uh, a little undersized defense that just flies to the football mm-hmm. and you have to make plays on them. And you, it, you're going to get maybe four or five chances a game to really make a big play. And you have to capitalize on all of them or you're going to have a hard time moving the football on them. And that's really what this defense has been about really for years. I mean, if you think about how good this past defense has been since Al Golden showed up, and then you consider the fact that they've played Drake May, they've played CJ Stroud, they've played Caleb Williams. And with the exception of one game by Caleb Williams in 2022, they shut those guys down. I mean, the, you yeah. know, C.J. Stroud had some phenomenal throws in the fourth quarter just to get to 230 yards and get Ohio State to 21 points in that game, in the game they yep. beat Notre Dame. You know, Drake May threw for 300 yards, but if you go back and watch the game, I think about 200 of them were in the last quarter to qu- – you know, when Notre Dame pulled their starters and they had some big plays because it was like – I think it was like uh, 45-17 and Notre Dame pulled their starters and then Drake hit a couple bombs, you know, on the backups and stuff stuff like that, completely shut Caleb Williams down last year. I mean, just dominated him, made him look like an undrafted free agent instead of the number one overall pick. And it's because they're an elite pass defense. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Now, of course, you just lost Benjamin Morrison for the year, which is a huge loss for Notre Dame. But they lost their other starting corner against Louisville, who I think has the best pass offense Notre Dame's going to face this year, and and held them relatively in check. I think they gave up 269 yards, but Tyler Shuck only went for 6.4 yards per attempt because he had to throw over 40 passes to get those 269 yards. That's going to be the key. And for Notre Dame, their run defense has been solid but not great. Well, that's the concern in this matchup against Georgia Tech is, okay, shut down their passing game. That's fine, but that doesn't mean a whole lot because they're still going to run their RPOs. They're still going to run their jet sweeps and get the ball to Singleton. And the other – Oh, I'm drawing a blank on the, the short Malik Rutherford. Rutherford. Right. Mm-hmm. Rutherford. They're still gonna they're gonna find ways to get them the ball, even if your downfield pass coverage is, is special. Yeah. And then of course, you know, it, this offense reminds me a lot of what Northern Illinois did. A lot of motions, a lot of shift, a lot of pre-snap movement. And there's some teeth to that pre-snap movement because if you don't react to it, they'll hand that sucker off and let those guys go on just yeah. sweeps, right? And and then of course you're gonna run a 510-ish athletic, quick powerful running back downhill sounds a lot like Ontario Brown right from Northern Illinois who was by by the way my second team preseason all opponent running back right so the second team guy tore Notre Dame up they got to make sure the first team guy doesn't do that and that's where you find out how has this team evolved how has this team matured since that game or do they have a plan to handle all the pre-snap movement because I'll be honest I said this in our show yesterday I had no clue who Buster Faulkner was when he got hired by George Tech no clue never heard that guy before and I'm watching him against Florida State like Okay, I don't know who this guy is, but I'm going to learn real quick because this offense is creative, you yeah. know, and they're executing. And it turned Haynes King from a guy that was a turnover machine last year yeah. to a guy that now only has, what, three total turnovers, only one pick. I think he's yeah. lost two fumbles, right? Uh, that's a heck of a coaching job. Now, obviously, Haynes is a part of that, but, like, heck of a coaching job to get the offense at that point in time. And they're not doing it because they're getting conservative. They're doing it because they're just executing at a much higher level. And that's the that's the concern for Notre Dame is with – you're out Benjamin Morrison. You don't have him. You're down to your third string starting weak side end, their Viper position, because their top two guys are both injured. You've had one of your top D tackles is not with the team right now. So you're a little beat up, and you're young in a lot of spots. So that's where Notre Dame is at. But it's going to really come down to, you want names to know, it's right up the middle. Riley Mills and Howard Cross, hmm. two veteran players. Uh, Riley Mills is a captain. Howard Cross is a preseason All-American. They were average the first four or five games of the year they were really good against louisville which impacted that game and they were back to their dominant selves against stanford was that just sort of a one-off or is that a sign of things to come it better be a sign of things to come if they're going to keep this georgia tech offense in check well i'll tell you this brian you have 
you have piqued my interest more into this game of maybe feeling like Georgia Tech has a better shot. Because when I'm looking at this, you know, just in terms, and we obviously have to see what happens to Haynes King and what that status is. A lot of the strengths, you know, Georgia Tech has benefited, you know, from a lot of the teams they have played. They have said, hey, even when your strength is, you know, this our strength, that goes against each other. Georgia Tech has won a lot of those head-to-head battles, especially last week against a North Carolina team. It was playing with a lot of emotions, obviously, with a, a teammate that passed away and, uh, you know, on the road. Uh, but not a great opponent, but a team that said, hey, we think we do this well. And then Georgia Tech completely blew that out of the water in a lot of different ways. So uh, we always end it with this question right here for each of our Behind Enemy Lines guests. Um, I say this statement, I give you a dot, 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 and you name maybe one or two things. So Notre Dame wins this game in Atlanta if what has to happen for the Irish to leave Mercedes Benz with a win? Well, the first thing is they have to control the lines, right? I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Their offensive line has to play well. If they do, Notre Dame will run the ball on Georgia Tech. And if they run the ball on Georgia Tech, they will score on Georgia Tech. And then the other one is shut down the run game. I mean, Georgia Mm -hmm. Tech is going to make some plays in the pass game, but I don't think they're going to make, even if Haynes King plays, I don't think they can make enough against what is an elite secondary uh, to win the game, unless it's a 17 to 14 type of game, right? So if Notre Dame wins the battle of the trenches on both sides of the ball, I think they win the game. I mean, that's really what Notre Dame's about, right? When Notre Dame is a good football team, they're good in the trenches. And then the other part is you have to be able to um, win the big play battle. And that's something that Notre Dame has been pretty good at. They were not against Northern Illinois. I mean, that game starts, Notre Dame goes right down the field, scores a touchdown. They pin Northern Illinois at the two-yard line. And three plays later, they rip an 80-something yard seam route up, you know, to their running back for a touchdown. You take that one play out of that game, and Notre Dame's right now 6-0, and and we're feeling great about them being a top-five team, and and everybody's happy and and all that kind of stuff, right? You've got to eliminate the big plays. And that's the only thing that kept Louisville in that game is they hit a couple big plays with Ja'Cory Brooks. And and even those were well defended. You just needed a perfect ball and a a perfect throw. And Notre Dame caught some breaks. You had a 43-yard run by Tyler Shuck that Leonard Moore comes up behind and knocks the ball out when Louisville was rolling at that point in time. Yeah. So, you know, that's really the key is win the trenches, win the big play battle. I, I think, and there's always the obvious things like, turnover and those are those are easy i mean that's always yeah. hey don't get beat four to one in the turnover margin <laughs> you don't need me on here you know you could have my grandmother on and she'd be able to tell you that right um but that's really the big key is win the big play battle which i think is a byproduct honestly bryce of winning in the trenches that, yeah. that's really what this game's going to come down to for me brian driscoll we appreciate the time before we get you out of here if georgia tech fans want to read more or they want to watch more about what you guys are talking about about this matchup maybe future matchups i just want to hear uh, some more about notre dame where can they find uh, your team's work well obviously when you're on youtube or you're searching your podcast platforms type in irish breakdown and you'll find us there uh, at those platforms we're going to be we broke georgia tech kind of an overview of the matchup yesterday we're going to dive into some numbers talk about game records today and then tomorrow we'll do sort of our keys to victory for Notre Dame and make our game predictions. So you can check us out at Irish Breakdown. And if you want to read our written content, just go to irishbreakdown.com and you'll find us there as well. And so we'll be we'll be breaking this game down all week. This is a big game for Notre Dame. I, I think a lot of Notre Dame fans have a very healthy respect for what this Georgia Tech team is. Uh, mm-hmm. They remember the team that almost beat Notre Dame in 06, not the team that they beat 55 nothing a couple years ago. Because most Notre Dame fans understand that was an anomaly type of stretch. That's not who Georgia Tech has been. Yeah. That's that's a, this is a whole different ball club than the one that you played back in 2021. Yeah, you mentioned that a dark, dark time in yes. football history. That was on the back end, or that was the first of what was a 100 nothing combined margin of loss. They lost 55 to nothing up in South Bend and then came back home for the Georgia game, which was 90 10 Georgia fans inside your home stadium, and Georgia beat them 45 to nothing in route to a national title. So, uh, you know what? I like what you said that there's a healthy respect. Um, I do want to ask you one more. Your 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 viewpoint on Brent Key and and what is you know is a guy who maybe looks from afar. Uh, what did you think of the hire initially, and what have you thought about you know just the, his ability to bring them back to what I feel is like a solid foundation? And now obviously they want to launch into being one of the better teams of the ACC. I thought it was a bad hire to be honest with you. Yeah. Well, I shouldn't say bad hire. Um, let's say questionable hire. Yeah, that's like, fair. okay, your team stinks and you're hiring from within the program of a team that stinks. And I didn't, you, know, you don't see a lot of offensive linemen, uh, line coaches become head coaches. So I just thought it was a, I don't know, like, um, okay, you don't even want to try to go outside the program and find somebody. Yeah. Uh, but he's done a great job. And you started to see it last year. I mean, even, even last year, just being a bowl eligible team was a huge accomplishment when you consider how bad that team was in the previous years. And it comes down to this his teams do two things really well. 
They compete like crazy, especially in the trenches, and they're confident. Yeah. And even when they fall behind, it's like you watch the, the you watch the Louisville game and they fall behind. It was like they didn't panic. You know, they yeah. just kept battling. They kept fighting. They didn't. They didn't. You know, they, you saw that in the um, what was it the the uh, so the the other game you guys lost was Syracuse, right? The Syracuse Same thing game, there. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like yeah, it didn't turn out your way, but it's not like they stopped competing. They stopped battling. Georgia Tech quit like mid second quarter against Notre Dame in twenty twenty one. I mean, it's like Notre Dame could have scored 80 in that game if they wanted to. And and that's really what it comes down to is there's a competence at Georgia Tech right now. And, and the other thing, too, is every head coach is ultimately defined by what kind of hires can you make. Yeah. And so far, he's made great hires. I mean, I didn't know who the heck Buster Faulkner was. And I I mean, I'm a former college football coach. I like to think I, I know a lot of coaches. I didn't know who the heck this guy was. <laughs> and then when they hired Tyler Santucci, I was like, okay, that's the one that I thought was a great hire. Because you get yeah. you get a defensive guy that's basically been with Mike Elko for almost a decade. You're getting a guy that knows football. And yeah. so I thought that was a great hire. And, and again, there's a competence to the defense now. If you're going to beat Georgia yeah. Tech's defense, you've got to beat them. You've got to beat them up front. You've got to beat them with your routes. You got to make good throws. You're not going to get the easy garbage points like that you got against them in the past, where just this hole opens up 10 feet wide for your running back to go to because you had three misfits in the run game. You're not seeing that yeah. anymore. Yeah. And, you know, you got this old school, you know, uh, you know, horse collar type of, you know, uh, or neck roll <laughs> middle linebacker. And you're just like, they play like that. Like he yeah. signifies, personifies this defense, right? Yeah. They're not the most talented in the world. There's not a future, a lot of future first round draft picks or guys are going to go on and become WWE champions, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> it's just a bunch of kids that battle their butts off, do what they're told to do and play with a great deal of confidence. Yeah. And it started from game one and it's even with losses. It's like they, they lose a football game and then and bounce back and do what the very next week go smack a pretty scrappy you know Duke team who was undefeated up to that point in time yeah. go on the road and beat a North Carolina team that had a lot to prove and a lot to play for yeah. and uh, you just they never quit they never flinch and that's something Lou Holtz used to always say like you know the team that wins is the team that doesn't flinch yeah and that's what I respect about this program so I'll, I'll admit I didn't think it was a good hire. Me neither. But he's yeah. done a heck of a job so far. He really has. And he's been smart in the portal, too. He's getting portal guys. But he's not getting the, the big name. I'm only here for the money. You know, he's getting guys in the portal that are hungry that have something to prove. You know, some guy yeah. that got benched at quarterback, for example, that's got something to prove. Not some portal quarterback that thinks he's, you know, high and mighty and, and needs this amount of dollars and everybody loves me and I'm going to the NFL. It, he's getting guys with chips on their shoulder. Yeah. And I think that fits that culture of what they're trying to build. Cause he's got a little bit of cockiness to him. You get him interviewed and I'm like, but it's genuine. And I've always said, coach, be yourself. If you're, if you're cocky, be cocky. If you're calm, be yeah. calm. Don't try to be calm because you're the head coach. Now, if you're, if you're kind of loud and cocky, be yourself. Yeah. And, uh, and he's done that and he's done a great job at Georgia tech. He really has. And you've been in and around the game players, other staff members, they notice when you're not yeah. being genuine as well. Oh yes. That's, oh, kids see right uh, through that. They see stuff. right through that stuff. They absolutely do. Brian, we appreciate the time, man. Sorry for keeping you a little bit longer, but I know our fans are going to appreciate it. We will link your channel and your site Thank down you. below. And, uh, man, we, we think so much. And it should be a fun game inside Mercedes-Benz yeah. on Saturday. I don't want it to be a fun game. I like blowouts <laughs> just because it's stressful <laughs> and it allows me to get my work done a little bit earlier. But uh, I'll be very surprised if it ends up being that. We'll, we'll see how uh, – we'll see. We'll see. Awesome. Brian Driscoll, Vyash Breakdown. Go check out their channel. It's going to be linked below with all the Georgia Tech Notre Dame preview matchup. Make sure you subscribe to our channel as well and shout out to our partner, Section 103, the best fitting. And hey, it's getting a little chilly in the Atlanta area. So you need to get some of that cold weather gear. Yeah. People had jackets on, you know, 50. Oh, I'm in Northern right? Indiana. It's, it's yeah. 50 degrees. Today. I don't want to hear y'all in Atlanta. It's seven I'm degrees not, in Atlanta this morning. It's people, in Atlanta. people got the, the pants and the, the big coats on. They're breaking out <laughs> down here in the South. But uh, man, we're going to show inside it. in a hoodie. Because it's cold in here. I want to hear it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Notre Dame, Georgia Tech, inside Mercedes-Benz. It'll be a fun one. We'll have that post-game reaction show around 10 minutes after the game hits double zeros. We'll catch you next time here on the Crowded Booth. Swarm Talk, everything Georgia Tech.